All right. Uh, I hope all of you are able to hear me. Wishing you a very warm welcome to today's session. So I hope uh, all of you are able to hear me. A very warm welcome to today's session. Um, so if you are coming in today, uh, I'm assuming a couple of things about you. So you can let me know in the chat over here on YouTube uh, if this is what it is. So you have thought about taking the GMAT in 2023 and uh, you are looking at applying to an MBA so that program so that you can get into a program in 2024, right? Um, so just let me know, if yes, if that's true, because today's session, I'm going to make sure that, you know, I cover all the ingredients required for you to have the right mindset along with the right uh, preparation plan, correct? So what do you need to do? What are the resources required? How do you prep yourself? So we'll be talking about that. I'll also be talking about some of the areas of uh, GMAT, including quant and verbal, so that you get a sense of what actually gets tested on the GMAT, right? And then you can make a decision whether this is a journey that you would like to do by yourself or if you need any prep, right? So we'll kind of cover that part a little later. I'll tell you how I can help you with your GMAT journey, GMAT prep. So before that, uh, just a quick uh, intro. So my name is uh, Arun Jagannathan and uh, I've been uh, teaching the GMAT for about two decades now. So um, essentially the idea is uh, through our course, what I really try to do is um, synthesize many, many hours of training students, right? So uh, remember, this is a time before online courses. So during the offline period, you know, during classroom sessions. Um, so just hundreds and thousands of students, when you train, you get an instinctive sense of how students think. So the way I would like to uh, approach GMAT is not like a GMAT uh, expert, right? Like I've been teaching GMAT for 20 years or so something that looked very obvious to me. But what is important is to see it from the student's mind, right? Like if you look at it, the analogy that I give is, it's like Harsha Bogle, uh, who is a commentator, right? So he understands how a normal viewer at home may uh, be, you know, kind of understanding the uh, stats or understanding the field placements. Whereas, you know, test cricketers uh, may, you know, use technical terms. So similarly, you know, I think it's very important to look at GMAT as a test taker, correct? So what is going inside your head during those two hours is a very important facet for us to consider if you're preparing for the GMAT, right? So that's something that uh, I believe um, I'll help you understand today. So today's session is actually to kind of give you a glimpse or an insight into what we have over here, which is how to think like a 760 scorer, right? So what is it that a 760 scorer is able to think? What is he able to do, right? So all of you understand what a 760 score is. It's a high score. I'll tell you what it means in a short while. But uh, that's that's what I'm going to be telling you. Uh, I've also mentored students who have gone to uh, some of the top schools, uh, you know, globally. Uh, so I also play the role of a MBA mentor. Uh, so just wanted to give a quick intro about me. Um, so before we begin, just wanted to get an understand, uh, you know, what is the audience that we are looking at. Um, you can just type one, two, three, or four. Uh, one, you have just started your prep. Um, second, you have kind of started it, but you have, uh, you know, stopped it at some point. Uh, three would be in case you have started it, you are at some point, but now you are looking at taking the test. So you have some time, but you're thinking, okay, is that something that, you know, a 760 scorer would look uh, at the test differently? Or you could be someone who's trying to say, well, um, this 760 seems to be illusion. So what is it that a 760 scorer thinks, right? That I am not able to think. So is there a perspective that I can gain? Um, so even people who have, so, okay, so we got three, four, uh, a lot of ones. So I can expect that. Uh, most of you have started. So what I will try to do is I'll try to keep today's session to cater to uh, this broad spectrum, but I will as assume that you have no knowledge of the GMAT, correct? So I'll just make that basic assumption that you do have no knowledge of the GMAT. 
and this is like the first you know starting for you all right as i told you what are the key things that uh, i hope to leave you with today uh, the first thing is how do we develop this gmat mindset right how do i make studying for the gmat interesting um, you heard me right interesting correct because see you can't hate something and do well in it you can't hate to play cricket and suddenly hope to you know hit a century correct so you have to love it so how do you love the process what is the process really testing you on how is it preparing you for a life that is beyond gmat even at b school uh, and life beyond b school so we'll look at that i will also kind of give you like uh, under the hood view of what gmat is very important that we don't confuse it with learning maths and english it's not about learning maths and english it's about scoring high on the gmat right so how do we score high on the gmat we have to understand the mechanics of the test what are the constructs that we have how do we optimize our performance and crucial to your prep is you know how to think on the gmat so i'll try to give you some questions and i will try to give you a idea of how typically people make mistakes and how sometimes just having a difference in the approach will make a huge difference to the way um, you are able to think on the gmat right and i will also tell you what are the study material that you need to use uh, in order to do the prep uh, so many of these are uh, available um, you know some of many of them are available for free on gmat club as well uh, but i will also be recommending some books uh, which are broadly retired question papers so previous years question papers in some sense right so it's retired gmat questions which no longer appear on the test so let's get started uh, before we get any further i wanted to do like a quick mental uh, warm up okay so i'm going to give you a very simple question I, okay i am not saying it's simple but the concept is very simple it's a percentage concept all of you understand percentage right so this looks like a question that could be asked someone in 8th or 9th standard so i want to see um, how you approach it so just don't tell me the reasoning just give me the answer a b c d e those of you are at at home maybe you want to take a paper and a pen also while you are hearing this okay so we got someone for b simple question right Nine nine percent out of twenty one hundred fish are red in color. How many do I need to remove to make it ninety eight percent red? I'm hoping for some answers. Okay, I'm going to give you one more option, which is F. In case you are completely confused, you can you can also say F. That's also fine. that i give up we have one more answer for b we have someone for e give me another 30 seconds because on the gmat you have to understand that you have to solve this question in about 2 minutes correct so you also need to be smart enough to know when to guess we got someone with a so dipun says b devesh b wahid e nitesh b agi a all right snehal also says b okay so we got like more votes for b so now i think as we get closer uh, perhaps more people picking b because you tend to go with 
the majority, right? So here is a question for you on the GMAT. I see a lot more bees uh, coming in now, right? So here is a question on the GMAT. On a tough question, do you want to go with majority or minority? On a tough question on the GMAT, do you want to go with majority or minority? I want you to think about it. I'm waiting for someone to respond. Well, on a tough question, correct Vahid, you want to go with the minority. That means there is something that people who are picking B are getting wrong. So if you have picked B, you are in the majority. All of you are thinking something. So let me just do a simple math over here. I'm going to solve this question in under uh, 20 seconds. Okay. On the GMAT, 20 seconds to solve this question. 99% of uh, 200 uh, fish are red. So we have uh, 198 red fish. Correct. So 198 out of 200 red fish. I want to make it 98 out of 100 red fish. Correct? To make 198 out of 200, 98 out of 100, how much do I remove? I remove 100. I remove 100 redfish. Answer is E for echo. Right? Because all the other answers that you are going to give me, right, will create some fraction. All of this will create some fraction, right? But it won't be 98%. Okay, so why did I give you this question? All of you got it? Give me, give me yes, if you understood the logic. So I also want you to think, right? What happened? Did I give you any theory that was out of the world? All of you understand how percentages work. But somewhere what happens is this question ends up challenging the way you think, the way you approach. And that is exactly what GMAT is really testing you on. We tend to think of GMAT as a test of knowledge. But in reality, it ends up being a test of your application of the knowledge. Knowledge can help you till a 500 on the GMAT, 450 on the GMAT, right? But once you get to a 600 plus range, once you want to get to a 700, definitely at a 760 level, I can tell you that it's how well you are able to apply. So Tevesh, 98 out of 100 is 98 percent, right? So I got the answer now because I, I remove 100 from the numerator, 100 would get removed from the denominator as well, right? So that is why 198 by 200 becomes 98 by 100. So this is what GMAT is really looking at. It's looking at whether you are able to apply logic to solving the problem. If you have a very formalic approach, whether it's sentence correction, whether it's a quant, if you're going to say, I'm going to memorize a bunch of formulas to do well on the GMAT, you are not. I can give you the entire formulas required on quant, you know, uh, 51, uh, you know, like the entire thing in a, in a sheet. Will you get a Q51? which is the highest possible score, possibly not, correct? Because at some point formulas are the simplest thing for us to learn. But how to apply it is what becomes important. And therefore, my submission to you would be to look at studying for the GMAT by developing the right mindset, okay? So what is the GMAT mindset? GMAT mindset is that of a problem solver, of someone who's able to apply logic to solving situations that he may encounter in real life also. Okay, and this is a very important part of you understanding how this work works, right? Now, for this, I want you to look at what are the average GMAT scores at some of the top schools, right? You look at a Stanford, which asks, you know, very nice questions, you know, what do you value in life the most? But then explain the 733 GMAT score, average GMAT. Right. So most of the top schools, if you look at it, especially, um, you know, for some demographically disadvantaged profile, um, it ends up, you know, GMAT, you, you just have to score higher than even what the averages are. Right. 
So there are people gunning for a higher GMAT score. And the reason why these schools look at a GMAT score is there is a logic for that also, right? Because what they are looking at is, think of it this way, your journey to GMAT is really your journey to, you know, to some MBA college, right? And that will hopefully, you know, give you some kind of a, a real life job. So what are the skills that are required for you to do well at work? You need to be able to read a lot of information, correct? A lot of data, a lot of information, but you don't need to memorize it. You need to know how to go back if you need to, you know, get anything from the data that you read. How do I, uh, you know, what is the big picture that I'm able to derive from? That is nothing but reading comprehension. But you can't just take this data and give your boss and say, oh, you know, this is what I read, right? So he's going to ask you to create your conjectures. He's going to say, what is it that we can assume over here, right? How will it help me? How will it hurt us? You know, so these are things that you need to, what are the inferences that I can draw? All of this is nothing but critical reasoning, right? And eventually, when you're submitting it to management, you need to make sure that your language is clean, crisp, concise, and that is what sentence correction is going to do. And a large part of it will involve numbers, which is what problem solving is about. Simple numbers. Are you able to read and interpret data correctly? And there is one more called data sufficiency, which is, is the data provided to you enough to solve the problem? In that type of question, they don't even want you to solve the question. They are just saying, is it possible to solve such a question if I give you this data? Right, but uh, many a times it can get very confusing. Right, but the point is, GMAT is really testing you on all these which are real world skills. And in fact, when you get to a B school, right, you are expected to read a case study one day before your um, class. So you will be up till late reading the case study, preparing for it. What are you doing? You are doing the same thing. You are expected to uh, read a lot. You are expected to go the next day in the class, defend your point, give your opinion, critical reasoning, prepare a report of what you learned, sentence correction, how well are you able to write clear uh, you know, sentences. So that is the way you need to look at your entire journey. So preparing for the GMAT is really preparing for the next step of your career. Correct? If you have made a commitment towards management, if you are thinking, oh, I want to do an MBA and I want to get into management, this is a skill that uh, you know you are better off learning now uh, using GMAT um, and and you know kind of understanding that these are core skills that we have to anyways learn. Correct. So that is that is really my submission to you that please uh, develop the right mindset. A lot of times what I've seen is students start their prep uh, and you know somewhere during uh, you know their prep journey uh, you know the scores don't match up to what they want or there is something. Always remember that in life, as with GMAT, you have to learn from mistakes. You have to keep iterating. You have to keep asking yourself, what went wrong here? How do I? So these are, this is again a life skill, right? Um, even at work, when you do a project, right, you may do a certain campaign. It's not working. What is not working? What are the root cause analysis? You no, know, figuring out how it is. The other thing about GMAT is you also need to keep your focus for two hours. So today, uh, attention spans are dipping. Right, uh, people are finding it very hard. So the future belongs to people who are able to kind of have a sense of focus. So GMAT will also help you develop a sense of focus towards what you need to do without getting distracted with your phone and other things. So look forward uh, to this opportunity as a learning opportunity, as an investment that you're making in yourself. The moment you look at it with that larger purpose, uh, the whole journey becomes enjoyable. And as the journey becomes enjoyable, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that you will you'll kind of see success, whether it's two months or it's four months, it's a question of time, right? I'll tell you what is the path to take, right? Now, uh, I'm going to get to the point on how GMAT works, right? And I want to give you a very simple way to uh, process it. You don't need to do a PhD on the GMAT algorithm, okay? So don't worry on that. I'll be giving you a glimpse. Uh, and I'll talk about what would it mean for us as a test taker, how do we address this or how do we uh, maximize this? So the first thing you need to remember is there are four 
broad topics uh, or four broad sections that you are going to get on the GMAT. You are going to get what is called as analytical writing ability, AWA. It's one topic you need to write an analysis of an argument. When we do critical reasoning, we will be teaching how to do analysis of arguments. So if you are doing critical reasoning, weekend questions, then your approach for this is taken care of. Usually people have a standard template they follow because you don't want to work your brain too much. Uh, this is graded out of six points. And uh, you know, as long as you get above four or five, you know, you should do well. And it's fairly easy if you follow a template, don't do something uh, you know, too fancy, uh, write simple sentences, keep your argument logical, right? Uh, that should be enough. Um, this will not go towards your three-digit GMAT score. Same thing for IR. You have about 12 questions, right? Uh, and this is um, scored out of eight. And uh, again, over here, uh, anything that is five plus is good enough. The idea is not to maximize it. The idea is to do it so that you are able to demonstrate that you have decent competence in this. But the main 800 score will be for quant and verbal. Quant is mathematics. So as I said, problem solving data sufficiency. You have a very simple equation, 61. Uh, 31 questions, 62 minutes, which means you get two minutes per question. Okay. Um, verbal, on the other hand, has 36 questions and you have 65 minutes. In case you are doing the math, let me help you. You have 108 seconds per question. Here you have 120 seconds per question. All right. So make sure that uh, you keep that in mind because this is going to be a very important factor. If you give someone infinite time and you give him 31 questions and 36 questions. There is a high probability that, you know, this guy may get all the 67 questions right. But when you put the time pressure, when you give five answer options, when you make it very confusing, uh, the equation completely changes. So we need to prepare ourselves for the GMAT, right? We don't need to prepare how to solve that question, how to get to the right answer. There is a difference, right? So don't try to solve, try to get to the right answer. That's the uh, approach that we need to have, especially when we are looking at time. Okay, so you might be thinking, "Acha, how this uh, you know sections are ordered?" So GMAT again gives you three options. Uh, one option it gives is you start with the AWA and IR, uh, and then you have a break, and then you take one, then you take verbal. Uh, till about you know a few years, this was the only option possible. Uh, many students would complain, "Ki you know one hour I'm spending doing AWA and IR." Um, and you know, by the time I get to verbal, I get to, I become very tired. Uh, GMAT then introduced two other order options. So it said you can also start your test with the verbal section. Then you can go to uh, the uh, the quant part after an eight minute break. Then you take a break. Then do IR and data. The second option works uh, if you want to start fresh with verbal. Um, and uh, the first option works well uh, when you are looking at uh, getting some kind of warm up. So sometimes students say, let me warm up with AWIR, my brain you know, starts working, and then I will get into quantum verbal. Some students say, you know, I want to be very fresh when I'm doing verbal uh, because I'm putting my 100%, I want to get a good score. So I want to start with verbal. Quant is my strength, I can manage it, so I can okay doing it. In any case, AIR, AWIR don't, matter so much so I can you know take it towards the end. Uh, but I also have options where you know students have come and said Arun um, verbal quant is my strong point. I want to get off the gates like you know really good uh, have a po positive momentum on the test. So I know I'll crack quant. So once I get to the quant I'll be able to take that confidence and uh, bring it into verbal right. Uh, again all of these are options that are available to you right so there is no one option that is better than the other so it's not like achha, people who score 760 use option two or three or one correct so it's not like that it's pretty much uh, spread uh, you get you know people getting high scores and low scores with each one uh, typically our advice would be that once you are done your prep you will have a period where you will be taking tests i'll be showing you which test to take uh, so when you're taking those tests that's a good point uh, for you to try out some of these options and see what works best for you. But at this point, if you are starting the prep, don't worry. If you are uh, somewhere towards the end, this is probably something that you want to consider. 
Um, now, one thing about the GMAT scoring algorithm is uh, all of us have heard of this word, or you might have, uh, or you might hear this, which is it's an adaptive scoring, right? So we hear this word adaptive scoring. So what does it mean? It means uh, let me tell you what it does not mean. It means it is not a linear score. So this is the you know uh, typical thing that we have, which is for every question that you get right, you get a particular score, and you know it's like more questions you get right, more questions. so you get hundred questions right, right? You will get a score you know of hundred something of that sort. This is not that. Okay. So GMAT has what is called as an adaptive algorithm, and what I do is. I will try to show you uh, this adaptive algorithm using an example. Okay, so let us say that there are uh, two students. Uh, I am going to call them A and B. Okay, uh, both are taking the GMAT, and uh, let us take. They are, let's assume that they are on the verbal section, right? And let's assume they are doing something similar in quant. Let's say that uh, both of them get you know a set of questions. Now let's understand how the adaptive algorithm works. Uh, GMAT has various buckets of questions. So you may have a 750 to 800 bucket, 700 to 750 bucket, 650 to 700 bucket, and let's say a 600 to 650 bucket. GMAT says that every time you get 60% uh, or more questions right, I will promote you to the next bucket. You get less than 40% of the questions right, I will demote you to a lower bucket. If you get somewhere between 40 to 60% of the questions, I'm going to maintain you in the same bucket, correct? Now, let us say that A and B were to start off at bucket 600 to 650. Now, let us say that the first six questions, uh, A is able to get three of them right, B gets four of them right. Because B gets 50% of it right, B, A continues to be in uh, the, the same bucket, but B got two thirds of it right, 66%. So B gets promoted to the next bucket. So now B will start seeing harder questions. Why? Because 650 to 700, I'm going to have harder questions than at 600 to 650. Now GMAT will give a string of eight questions. Out of this, again, A gets four of them right, B gets six of them right. So B gets promoted to the next bucket because uh, three out of four, Sadika percent, so gets promoted. Then let us say there is a string of 10 questions, again, A gets five of them right, B gets six of them right, uh, B again narrowly manages to go to the last bucket. The final, uh, so, so far, uh, you know, 24 questions have been consumed. We have a total of 36 questions. So let's say there is a last string of six questions and both of them get six questions right. B continues to be here. B may end up with a 760 on the GMAT. Whereas A may end up with a 620 on the GMAT. Now, if you look at it, what will happen is you will see that uh, um, A got, let's do the math over here. So A got 18 questions right and uh, B got 22 questions right. So the difference between A and B is only four questions. Correct? Right? That is the delta. So B got four more questions than A right. But look at the difference in the score. Why? Because this is a concept of weighted average. Because when A was solving questions which were easier level to maintain, let's say, this accuracy, B had to contest with a lot tougher questions. So GMAT rewarded B for the quality of questions that he was able to answer higher order questions. So on the GMAT, what we want to do is we want to ensure that we are getting more questions right so that we are encountering harder difficulty questions. Now, just imagine what would have happened if B, instead of getting, uh, let's say, six questions right, got only three questions right. And maybe in the final string of 12 questions, uh, got only uh, four questions right. Maybe B would have been demoted to a lower bucket. Correct? So that's the key that we need to remember when we are looking at uh, the GMAT algorithm, that accuracy is not the problem. So because what will happen is A and B both will come and they'll say, oh, my accuracy is 50%, my accuracy is 60%. 50%, 60% doesn't matter. The quality or the difficulty level of the question is what dictates your score. So I hope this gave you a, a good idea of what the GMAT scoring algorithm is. Again,
the idea is not for you to know this and somehow beat the algorithm. You cannot beat the algorithm, right? You you have to be smarter than the algorithm, right? Remember it that way. So how does this work? How, how are the percentiles working? So I'm just giving you a sense of uh, a typical percentile. So you see a perfect 800 score, uh, which is the 99th percentile, of course. But uh, even a 760 on the GMAT will give you a 99th percentile. What is considered to be a competitive uh, score when you're applying is anything which has seven as the most significant bit, which you realize is somewhere around the 87th percentile, correct? So if you're applying to top schools in the world, uh, which are themselves in the top 1%, then of course, your scores also should reflect the caliber of someone who has the academic um, you know, uh, rigor, who can take the academic rigor of such a course. So you, know, you are looking at a high GMAT score. Now, the interesting thing about GMAT is, GMAT is a test that is made by statisticians. So what they have tried is they have tried to confuse you. Okay, I'm going to keep it very simple. Remember the algorithm that I showed you, correct? This algorithm will produce a number out of 51. Both quant and verbal, it's out of 51. And again, it may sound very confusing. Why is 51? Why not 50? Why not some other number? But as I said, created by statistician, so can be a little confusing. So it is out of 51. Uh, interesting thing to notice over here is that in verbal, it is a 97th, 99th percentile, whereas in quant, it is only a 97th percentile, which means that 3% of the population taking the test are actually getting a perfect 51 on the GMAT uh, quant. Whereas in the case of verbal, all the way up to a 45 will yield a 99th percentile, which means in that sense, GMAT, it's a lot tougher to get a score above 45 in verbal. Um, and, you know, any score above 40 is considered a fairly decent score. So, uh, 40 would be um, the 90th percentile, right? So, so that's the 90th percentile. Uh, so, let's look at quant. Quant, it's very funny. So, in verbal, uh, even if you go to a 36, right? It is still, you know, somewhere around the 79th, 80th percentile, correct? Whereas in quant, what you see is a 51 drops it. Okay, so look at the drop. So from 97, you go down to 87, then you go down to 73, right? Then you go down to 66, 65. So by the time you are at a 46, you go down to a 53rd percentile on the GMAT in quant. What it means is, that in the quant, you need to be looking at a fairly higher raw score. Okay, so this is just a, a idea of how GMAT is going to uh, look at the various uh, this. Let me just try to see how do I minimize the screen. Okay, all right. So great. Okay, so now you must be wondering that uh, what score out of fifty one and in quant and verbal, do I need to get in order to get my, you know, three-digit GMAT score? I will be showing you a simple table that will help you do the conversion. Uh, but let's take some numbers. Let us say that you have a QV40 and a Q50, right? So you scored the 87th percentile in quant and uh, you scored the 90th percentile in verbal. This will give you a GMAT of 740, right? If you want to, let's say, score a 42 uh, and a 50, the same thing will become a 760, right? So Q50, V42 is a fairly, uh, you know, standard score that uh, students aim for when they are looking at a 760 kind of score. But again, you know, uh, though my uh, session is meant to say that for 760, but let's also look at it, even if you are looking at a score of 700, right? So for you to get a 700, you can do a Q49, V36, right? Q49 will give you a, will give you the 73rd percentile, correct? Um, and uh, you will have um, a 36 giving you the 79th percentile, right? So round about you are getting similar percentiles, so you will get a, you know, GMAT score of 700. So very important that you keep in mind 
what kind of score you are aiming for, for that, what kind of font scores you require, what kind of verbal scores you require. Having that in mind will help you keep your plan with a goal. Otherwise, you will keep preparing without knowing what is my destination. Fix your destination. Uh, if you are starting off, taking a test immediately would always help for you to get a sense of what the GMAT is all about. Again, I'm going to be talking about those uh, resources a little later, but uh, do consider taking like a diagnostic, that's also fine. But uh, when you eventually take the test, you will be able to uh, look at it. Now, here is the thing, you know, there is something that a guy who's scoring 700, which is, you know, the 87 percentile knows, right, which a person scoring, let's say, a 600 on the GMAT doesn't know, correct? So somewhere around the 50th percentile. So something that half the GMAT test takers don't know, the guy is scoring 600 knows. But there is something that almost 90% of people don't know that the 700 guy knows. And there is something that 99% are not able to do, which the 760 guy is able to do. Correct? So what is that? And again, if you have your goals set for quant and verbal, ask yourself. That a person who's scoring the 80th percentile, 36, right? What will it take for that person to score, let's say, the 90th percentile, which is a V44, right? A Q50 and a V44 will give you a 770, right? But there is something that is, you know, stopping. What is that thinking? Let's have a look at it. Uh, by the way, this is the table that I uh, told you about. So we also have a blog on uh, the GMAT scoring algorithm. So uh, maybe we'll share it in the chat window over here. Yeah. So you can just click on it. Uh, and that uh, resource also has the scoring algorithm. So please do take a look. Now, every, you know, verbal score, right? And the quant score, you have a corresponding number. So, you know, let's say I'm going to randomly pick this number, right? So you can get a V48. So for someone who feels that they are very poor in quant. So you say that in quant, I can, I can score only a V42, which is a 39th percentile, right? Then you have to score a V48, which is very high 99th percentile for you to get a respectable, you know, 730 can also. So you need to pick your battles, right? So if you say I'm weak at something, I would suggest not to say that, but rather look at GMAT as a challenge. There is nothing like strong or weak. If you have your right mindset, you should be able to breeze through the test. It will actually attract people who are problem solvers, right? It will repel people who are, you know, who just want to mug up something and, uh, you know, somehow get this magic trick to score a high GMAT score. Um, so, uh, how to think on the GMAT? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the session today uh, trying to give you some uh, food for thought uh, about how to approach each of the sections. So, since we started off with quant. Uh, let me give you a question in quant. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to solve. Um, two minutes. If you have a paper and a pen, take it out. Um, and uh, please give me the answer in the chat window. So a lot of times what happens is when you're reading this question, a um, lot of us feel, oh, there is some formula that I don't know. <clears throat> and the moment we try to uh, think that, okay, there is some magic formula uh, which will help me solve this question miraculously, um, you are not getting the point, correct? So by the way, this is this may not be a very GMAT-like question, correct? But this is a good question uh, to kind of illustrate the point 
that we are trying to make over here. Uh, any question, any answers, you can put, put in the chat window. We are roughly uh, one and a half minutes into it. Okay, so we got one answer E. D. So here is the thing I told you that uh, on the GMAT, you have roughly uh, two minutes for such questions. So your two minutes is up, correct? Now you need to make a decision. Those of you who are solving, right? If any one of you is doing it this way, I will first calculate this, then I'll calculate this, then I'll calculate this, then I add up all of these values. Anybody doing it that way? The zigzag method. If you're doing the zigzag method, you probably are going to give up on the computation bit. I will solve this question in under two, 20 seconds. Okay. So let's read the question. On GMAT, very important that we read the question properly, correct? So it says that there are two stations A and B, and the distance between A and B is so A, there is a train that is going towards. I hope my drawing of the train is good. So there is a train that is going towards B and it's going at 40 kilometers per hour. Right, but what it does, the moment it touches B, it goes back. So the there is a bird that is sitting on top of the train. So what the bird does is it starts flying at 60 kilometers per hour. So it goes to B, touches B, comes back, train has traveled some other distance, again touches the train, goes back, and keeps doing this zigzag movement till both the train and this reach B together, correct? And it's given that the distance is 200 kilometers between A and B. Now, a very simple way to solve it, and again, I gave you some time to understand, explain how the question is structured. The question is very uh, complicated, but if I were to simplify, what we need to know is the speed of the bird. Sorry, the distance covered by the bird. Right? Now, we know that speed of the bird is equal to distance upon time taken. This is the basic formula for speed. Therefore, what can I say? Distance that the bird traveled, therefore, is the speed of the bird multiplied by the time that the bird took to travel. Now, what is the speed of the bird that is given to us? It is 60 kilometers per hour. What is the time taken by the bird? Well, the bird is going to do this till the train, it turns around the distance between, correct? When does the train reach? So 200 kilometers the train has to travel at 40 kilometers per hour. So that means the train was traveling for five hours. So therefore the bird was flying for five hours. So if the bird was flying for five hours at 60 kilometers per hour, the total distance traveled by the bird would be 300 kilometers. Correct? Now you can look at it, right? So as I said, if you're going to do this like D1, D2, D3, do, do some summation, do some, you know, integration on this, it's just going to get confusing. But if you are able to have it approach simply, you will be able to find the answer. Okay. What we will do is, let us look at a question and this time I'm giving you a question in uh, critical reasoning. Okay. What I want you to do is think of yourself as a venture capitalist. You are a VC, uh, maybe you are Sequoia, or these days, uh, you know, that's also something that has got a lot of bad reps. So maybe uh, you want to you know, uh, be some other VC. Uh, and you are looking at investing money 
in lightbox ventures lightbox inc okay so let us see what lightbox says lightbox says that they own almost all the movie theaters in a particular county and what they have done is they are also planning to double the number of movie screens correct so when you have a theater you can have multiple screens right and in the next 5 years they are saying they are going to double it yet this is a clue for me yet but however now there is something opposite that is going to come however attendance is only large enough for profitability now right now they are attending whoever is attending they are profitable just now and the country's population is also not expected to increase over the next 10 years so that means the total population will not go up right clearly now think about it he is giving you this word therefore when do people say therefore when they want to conclude when they want to put their main point what is the main point he says if there is no increase in population the new screens are unlikely to prove profitable which means they will not be profitable now the question is asking you which of the following is true most seriously weakens the argument what we need to prove therefore as a vc is light box will be profitable this is what you need to prove correct now let's look at the answer options and i'm going to you know directly get to some also when you read the answer options what is very important is there will be data that is given to you from outside correct so there is some outside information that we need to consider by which it might be wise for us to invest in like boxing i'm going to do one thing i'm going to start all the way from e uh, e says there are no population centers in the county that are not already served by at least one of the movie theaters that lightbox owns and operates this is actually one of the reasons why lightbox will not be profitable correct it is strengthening the argument that yes therefore it is unlikely to be profitable because you are already maxed out so e cannot be the answer d says spending on video purchases as well as spending on video rentals is currently no longer increasing therefore people will go to movie theaters uh well that is something that we are assuming correct because now you have to stretch that video purchase and video rentals right is not increasing but if that is not increasing does it mean that more people will end up seeing movies we do not know in selecting the mix of movies lightbox policy is to avoid those that appeal to only small segment fair enough this is this is fine but this is actually not impacting our argument at all why because such a policy is telling you that they are anyways appealing for a large audience so they are anyways doing it so why will adding the extra screens be profitable correct if the population is not changing b says the sales of snacks and drinks account for more of lightbox profits than the ticket sales do fair enough but we already know that the current is only large enough for overall profitability now what answer option b says is that overall profitability is coming from x uh, head count or uh, y you know item so internally how that is distributed is not something uh, that really impacts the argument uh, what does that leave us with that leaves us with answer option a which is what most vcs bet on why do you think zepto is getting funding zepto is getting funding because they believe that little change in the size of population but a pronounced shift towards younger more affluent more entertainment oriented population is expected to occur people who do not want to go to the grocery store who just how many of you use uh, if you are in india use a uh, 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 thing like uh, let's say swiggy or uh, zomato or um, zepto or big basket like right? so all of these apps let you deliver correct so if you want to say acha people are not um, 
the population is not going to go up. What they are bet betting on is my formula for profit is the per person profit into total people, correct? So let's say this is X and Y. So even if Y does not change, he says X will change. More people will be buying, therefore we will get more profits. So therefore A for alpha is the correct answer. And again, what I want to uh, show by this question is uh, how GMAT can actually be very interesting, correct? So it, it expects you to apply your uh, mind to problems. Uh, it expects you to uh, kind of, you know, use some real world logic to solve. <clears throat> All right. So let's do this. Let's look at a sentence correction question. Again, uh, remember that I'm going to give you a clue. Do not try to solve this question. Try to get to the right answer. Okay. There is, there is a difference in your approach. Uh, just to make sure all of you understand, there is a complete sentence out of which a part is underlined. You have answer option A that repeats the option. So if you think there is no error, pick answer option A. But if you think there is an error, pick B, C, D or E. Okay. I'm going to give you roughly 90 seconds, which is what you will get on the GMAT as well. About a minute gone into the test and uh, in case you are wondering that there is some uh, grammatical rule that you need to know, uh, there is actually a very simple application of logic that you can use uh, for this question. Okay. Um, and I'm going to give that clue now and let's see if uh, that helps you. Remember that the clue can also lie in your un-underlined part. In fact, for this question, very important that we look at the ununderlined part. There is some clue that you have over there. Perfect. So I'm going to give uh, the answer now. Okay. Um, so if you look at it, it says it proved unpopular because it looked at felt too much like a quarter. What is it over here? It needs to have a noun. It is a pronoun. So it needs to have an antecedent. It needs to have a noun. What is the noun? The only answer option that gives you the noun, the coin, is answer option A for alpha. All of the other answer options do not provide the it with an antecedent. Okay. So the coin now tells me that yes, because, but the coin proved unpopular because it looked. None of the other answer options actually give you that. Okay. Again, we don't have time to get into the roots of grammar. Otherwise, there are other ways 
to solve this also okay but just keeping today's session in mind i'm going to give you a last question and again i'm trying to point out to the thinking that is required for you to uh, you know look at uh, a section like cr section like sc section like quant and i'm going to give you a reading comprehension passage and uh, let's take a minute to read the passage and maybe after that i will show you the question I know RC passages are no fun, but it's a very short passage, so you can just take a quick read through. Okay, so what you realize on the GMAT is that uh, the passages by themselves are not, uh, you know, going to be super tough, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's written in English. Um, and, you know, so what he says is, look, um, vigilant behavior is of two types in smaller groups. He says it's of two types. One is uh, to avoid predators. And uh, the second one is uh, to find food. Very short passage, first paragraph on avoid predator, second paragraph on finding food, but the overall passage talks about vigilant behavior in animals, right? Now, let us see what will happen if we ask a question. Now, I'm going to give you just some time to read the question and just look at the answer options, and then I will uh, jump in and tell you uh, what is the best way for us to solve this. This is the last question that we have for the day. Don't worry. All right. So I will I will try to look at it and say well if I would read this question um, I'm pretty sure many of you got would have been very confused right now here is where having a proper strategy on the GMAT helps I'm going to teach you a couple of strategies that you can see how getting to the answer becomes very easy uh, the first thing that we need to know is uh, it is an inference question one thing about inference question is inference question has to be based on what is given in the passage okay now look at it it is saying vigilant behavior directed at predators vigilant behavior directed at predators where is it it is in the first paragraph it is in this particular line so we now have been able to even read the line where it is mentioned but sometimes what may happen on the GMAT is despite reading this sentence, uh, it may be very hard for you to, you know, kind of wrap your head around what it's trying to say. It says individuals on the edge are more vigilant uh, because they are at a greater risk of being captured. But you cannot get a sense that this is what 
the question is asking about. So you know that the answer to this question lies in this sentence. Okay. You also know that it's an inference question, which means it has to be from what is given in the passage. Correct. Now, if you look at all the answer options, you will notice that all the wrong answer options have something that is giving us data from outside. What does it say about, you know, um, when predators were in that area versus predators not in that area? Is there anything about that? Predators being in the area, you cannot assume yourself. If predators are there, they'll become more vigilant. Predators are not there, they'll be less vigilant. You can't assume that. A goes off because there is no, nothing mentioned in the passage. B says risk of capture was same whether it's located in the interior or periphery. I see that, right? Uh, it talks about animals on the periphery of the group, right? It, it gives you something about the risk of capture being uh, related to it. So I'm going to hold on to B. C says animals on the periphery, great. But what it says are less capable of defending themselves. Is there anything about the animals being able to defend themselves? They are just talking about the vigilant behavior, not the ability to uh, defend. D says animals on the periphery tend to bear marks that were more distinctive to predators than animals located in the interior. Now, this is a question that is giving you something to imagine, right? So because that they have a mark, the predators are going to find the you know, um, prey and, you know, I mean, you have to assume a whole lot. Same thing with E, correct? They have shorter lifespans because they uh, smoke and drink too much. Right? Point is, this is not given to us in the passage. The only thing given is B for brown. So, this is what we teach in the class. We we have a technique for this. Um, you know, we call it skim and scam. Scam works very well for our students where we spend about two minutes uh, skimming the passage, what I showed you. So we have a technique on that. And then we spend the rest of the time, uh, you know, scanning, which is going to the questions, looking at the answer options and uh, trying to eliminate the wrong ones, right? Uh, elimination is your friend on the GMAT, not selection, right? You need to have an approach, especially on verbal, to know what is wrong rather than know what is right, okay? So with that, okay, uh, I'm going to come to the last section. We are about at the one minute, one hour apart, but I'm going to take maybe another uh, five, 10 minutes, but uh, please do, um, you know, stay back because I think this is, this is crucial. How does all of it tie together? Now I showed you the GMAT scoring. I showed you the algorithm. Uh, GMAT questions are created by psychometricians, which are across, according to very prescribed standards that GMAT has. Okay. So therefore, it's important for us to know what those GMAT standards are. And those GMAT standards come through when we look at uh, the official questions. What are the official questions? Official questions are a set of almost 1,000 questions, uh, which are retired GMAT questions, um, which you know uh, will give you uh, the questions along with you know, the explanation as well. One of the things that you know GMAT explanations is uh, it's a text explanation. Uh, you know, the way it is worded, the way it is written, anyone who has gone through the OG explanations know that it's fairly painful. Um, so I have something for you. If you stay back, I'll tell you how, um, you know, this actually can be solved. But this is definitely the most important, valuable uh, resource that you would need uh, because you need to set yourself to think what the GMAT test center is going to do. Uh, you have the GMAT starter kit and two official practice tests. Uh, that are free, uh, but I think you need to buy the rest of them. Uh, I think it's about eight nine dollars. So you have a total of six tests, which if you take a reset, you can take even twelve tests. So don't worry about mock tests. There are plenty of mock tests, so you don't need to worry on that bit. Okay. Um, coming to optional prep material, uh, so you can also along with the official guide, uh, all the books look the same. But uh, this is official guide called OG. Uh, you also have VR. You also have QR. QR is quantitative review. VR is verbal review. So again, 300, 300 questions that you have. Uh, most of these are books that you can buy on Amazon. Uh, if you have friends or people that you know who have used the book, you can always ask for hand-me-downs. Uh, it is not necessary that you get the current year. Even if you get any of the previous years, should not be a problem. Uh, because largely the test questions as such have not changed over the last uh, few years. 
Uh, as I said, um, you know, if you have taken the two tests, the three tests that are given to you, you also have an option to take uh, the optional tests. So you get uh, four more tests uh, that you can buy from MBA.com, which is the official uh, uh, you know, website for the GMAT. Uh, a lot of times students, uh, you know, one thing you have to realize is GMAT official guide is uh, graded from easy to hard, which means the initial questions are easy, the questions towards the end are hard. So you will find harder questions also on the GMAT, uh, on the OG, and we are in QR, but you will also find easy questions. So a lot of students have, I want only hard questions. So if you think you have reached that level of mastery that uh, you want to do only hard questions, then GMAT has come up with, uh, you know, about uh, 300 questions in uh, 150 quant, 150 verbal questions, which they call as advanced questions. This they claim are some of the tougher questions on the GMAT, okay? Again, these are all optional prep material, but your journey on the GMAT, you have to be judicious of what is the right material for you to use. Uh, of course, you know, uh, I, I want to also mention over here that uh, you obviously have a lot of uh, questions that are on GMAT club as well. Uh, one kind of, uh, you know, uh, thing that I would like to tip or advice that I would like to give you is there would be a lot of questions on there are a lot of people who will create their own questions and ask hypothetical questions. My take is don't waste your time reading up such questions. Um, you will be able to create a filter on GMAT Club. Once you go to GMAT Club, you should be able to do that. When you're trying to search, you can search for a filter. Try to search for official questions. You will find a lot of threads where official questions are being discussed. So again, if you are okay reading a text, because text me what will happen is you will say A is right for this reason, B is wrong for this reason. Yes, he is wrong for such so it will give you all the reasons, but sometimes you know it does not have um, the, the the kind of you know if I could use that word perspicacity to look at a question and try to see what is it that you know uh, how do I actually solve this right? How do I uh, understand uh, how to do it in two minutes, one 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 hundred and eight seconds? So, uh, but that is pretty much what you need. Uh, but trying to put all of it together, I also wanted to. Uh, talk about the GMAT, uh, the Crash Global GMAT learning system. So as you know, over the last one hour, if you've heard me, you understand that we know this test, right? Uh, I've been teaching this for many years. So we understand how the test work. So what we have done is uh, we have made our test, uh, you know, very uh, structured. So we don't give too much of theory. I think giving too much of theory sometimes can bore you. Um, there is enough of theory that you need to know. So we make sure that we get those theory uh, pieces, concept pieces out of the way. But what we do is, the unique thing is, we solve using OG questions. So our entire course is in that sense based on uh, the OG questions. So when you look at each question, how do we approach? And because it's a video explanation, right? You are able to think, okay, uh, this question, what should I have seen? There was this error, that was this error also. But this error was a bigger error than the other error. If you chose B, you are probably thinking this, but you should have thought this way. So if you do this for 1,000 questions, okay, if you are able to apply uh, that logic, right, because everything that we teach is based on logic. So once you are able to get the logic-based approach, you will realize that studying for the GMAT is a lot, lot easier, a lot more fun uh, than you think it is. And uh, what's more, uh, you'll also be able to attend the GMAT orientation session. Uh, you'll have access to the strategy module. You'll have uh, some free content on quantum verbal. We have some topic-based tests, of about 100 plus questions that you can also try out. Uh, and we also have live instructor-led sessions uh, over the weekends on Saturday and Sunday. So in case you are interested to attend those, uh, you would let me, you, you can let us know. The link is provided in the chat window. So please make sure uh, that you go ahead and uh, register for it. And I hope to see you uh, sometime soon. In case uh, you are wondering, where are you in the prep? Uh, is GMAT for me? You know, uh, I have questions about the MBA application process. You can always talk to our counselors uh, we have a dedicated team. Uh, we have been working very closely. Many of my experienced counselors have been doing this for many years now. So they have a bird's eye view. They have a you know a ringside view of how uh, application season works. 
because we have hundreds of students who come to us. So these 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 people work very closely with them. So um, you can talk to them, share your plans, uh, and we will be glad to uh, help you out. Again, uh, you can hit us up on WhatsApp on the number that's given over here, uh, or you can schedule a call uh, by clicking on the Bitly link. All of this is is will be found in the in the uh, live chat below. All right. So we are about an hour, ten minutes into it, uh, and done for the. Um, session. I hope you are able to take away something for your prep. Uh, I hope the last one hour was, you know, beneficial um, to you. If so, uh, please do uh, consider track global for your prep. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel that we put up a lot of content. You can search for Arun Jagannathan also on YouTube. You'll be able to get. Uh, content uh, of, of earlier videos that we have shot, but we are also trying to produce more video as we are getting into 2023. Uh, any questions, uh, please let me know in the chat box. Um, I'd be glad to help answer any questions if you have. I'll wait for another minute or so. All right, so I assume, uh, uh, so if you can just let me know in the chat window, uh, if you found uh, the session useful, uh, did you like it? Um, so uh, Vivek says, thank you for a wonderful session. Thank you, Vivek. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, all the best for your preparation. And uh, while we are we are at it, uh, in case uh, anyone is watching this as a recorded video uh, on uh, YouTube, uh, then this was a live session uh, that was conducted uh, on 7th Feb. So um, how to deal with, so Sandeep has a question on how to deal with mental fatigue while uh, practicing quant. How many questions should we uh, be practicing daily? So Sandeep, I'll be taking that question, but wanted to acknowledge Tevesh. Uh, very helpful. Ravi Gupta, very informative session. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, for uh, attending today's session. Uh, Nitesh Gupta, also again, thank you so much for the session. Helped us a lot. Uh, I'm glad that I was able to help you. I'm going to take up Sandeep Shetty's question, which is, how do I take care of mental fatigue? The whole thing about prep is to build your mental stamina. So as you start, you will be in the improvement phase. Improvement phase is where you are learning. And when you're learning, you don't want to do it in too much of time limit. Uh, you don't want to, you know, you want to take your time. Why? Because you're perfecting your approach. Remember, you want to always pick effectiveness before efficiency. Effectiveness is getting the question right. Efficiency is getting it right to two minutes. So focus on effectiveness. Then what happens, your second phase of your prep is what is called as the optimization phase. So in our program, we have the uh, improvement phase and then the optimization. When we get to optimization, the whole focus is on you to actually uh, practice more questions in a timed way, uh, take more tests, analyze those tests. What could be your strategy? Um, there are some simple uh, mindfulness methods that we teach, uh, including taking deep breaths, okay? Uh, can sometimes help just hit a reset button in your head. But to a large extent, if you're enjoying uh, solving questions, um, and you are able to practice in timed conditions, you should be able to develop your mental stamina. Um, Nitesh, uh, you are a working professional. Please suggest how to prepare a mindset for uh, preparation. So, Nitesh, the first thing that you need to do is uh, remember that uh, most people applying, think about it this way, the guy who is going to get into Harvard Business School in 2024, which means he is applying to Harvard Business School in 2023 which means he's right now taking the GMAT, right? That guy probably has a very hectic schedule also. Maybe he's an analyst at McKinsey or Bain, or maybe he's a, you know, investment banker, right? Uh, working as a financial analyst. All of these are very demanding jobs, right? So, you know, many a time what happens is we sometimes like to, uh, you know, kind of say that, oh, it's my condition, right? But 
then you know you could I, I fear that we may end up playing the victim card right like oh my situation is wrong or i don't have time but look at it this way most people preparing for the gmat uh, are in demanding jobs so they don't have time so how do you make out time how do you create that time is something that uh, you know uh, would challenge you but i think is a very important endeavor for you to kind of take up uh, because not just now but throughout your life you need to be looking at upskilling yourself so if you are not able to take out time for gmat then my question is are you taking out time to upskill yourself right so that's what i would kind of uh, you know uh, kind of leave you with which is uh, this of course use your weekends so if you look at uh, our live program we have about 8 hours of classes on the weekends and then we have homework to be done on weekdays right so during the weekday if you are a early morning person you can wake up a little early spend one hour doing practice questions or you know spend an hour in the evening if you are a late night person maybe 11 to 12 right start with one hour a day right then you get to one and a half hours get to two hours don't try to overdo everything right many a time what happens we start our prep is you know i'm going to study eight hours a day it doesn't work that way so spend time on the weekends but during the weekdays a couple of hours of consistent practice is more than sufficient um and i'm just going to stop the screen sharing and i'm just going to have my screen come up uh let me just look at some of the other questions i have uh devesh has this question i'm stuck with 50% accuracy in verbal practicing questions for the last month but no improvement uh so devesh the way i look at it is why do we not get the desired results despite practicing okay um so my way to look at it would be what is it that we are learning from the mistakes we are making remember the more mistakes you make the smarter you get because every time you make a mistake you know there is something that you are learning right so gmat at the end of the day is a standardized test it is not going to ask you questions which are you know out of scope right it has a fairly limited scope and if you have been doing official material in your mind you are able to intuitively build what such a framework of official uh, you know uh, questions would do if that is the case you know i would just say you have to look at your approach you look at your technique many times what happens is we look at the symptoms for example i am running out of time i am not able to solve the questions in the correct time well that is a symptom it's like a headache right headache is a symptom headache is not the diagnosis your diagnosis could be that you are taking way too much time in reading comprehension right so you need to do an rca of what are the areas is it theory that you are having a problem with is it applying it on the gmat question that you are having a problem with is there a strategy on the test that you need to have a problem with so when we get our students into the optimization phase we actually deep dive into these things because that's where you need someone to kind of talk to you and get inside your head to clarify uh, such questions right so i hope i will really give you some uh, answer on that um all right sandeep so i'm i'm very happy that uh, you are a user so um hope to see you in uh, some of the sessions inside the course uh, and uh, a big thank you for all of you for staying up uh, all the way till the end of the session really appreciate it um and wish you a great rest of the day and uh, if you are in india or uh, somewhere in the subcontinent wish you a very good night